Yeah, so today we're going to be talking about uh, more types of reactions. Uh, I don't believe in the same depth that we went into precipitation reactions. Uh, but acid-base neutralization reactions. <clears throat> so actually on, your, on the lab benches, there's sodium bicarbonate. And if you ever spill an acid, you use the sodium bicarbonate and you sprinkle that onto the acid that you spilled and it neutralizes it. Um, and it does that by dissolving the sodium bicarbonate into the water and uh, acids, which we'll get more into definitions of acids in a later chapter, but acids tend to form H plus ions in solution and bases tend to form OH minus ions in solution. So the acid, if you spill it, has those H plus ions. Sodium bicarbonate will create, um, well, I guess it doesn't really create OH minus ions, but essentially it creates OH minus ions in solution and those neutralize each other. So they react together and form water. Uh, if it spills just on the lab bench, it doesn't matter because the lab bench is resistant to acid. If it spills on like your stuff, then okay. yeah. It'll eventually, the, most of the acids that we work with in this lab, aside from the nitric acid from last week, um, yeah, last week actually had a lot of concentrated acids. Those would cause some damage to like your like pieces of paper and stuff, or if you got them on your skin. Um, and if you get it on you, though, you want to rinse it off. You don't use the sodium bicarbonate. Acids, though, <clears throat> we've talked about these as part of nomenclature, but they're easily recognized because they all start with hydrogen. Uh, it's the only time that an element will start with hydrogen is if it is an acid. Uh, they also have a sour taste, so like Sour Patch Kids have acids in them, organic acids that are safe to eat, of course, uh, but they taste sour. And they can dissolve uh, some metals. And then bases tend to form OH minus ions in solution. They um, come mostly, or they'll form metal hydroxides or come from metal hydroxides. So that means it's something like um, magnesium hydroxide, so metal with one or two, potentially more hydroxides. Bases have a bitter taste. Um, in fact, coffee, or actually caffeine, is a base. And so if you've ever had just pure caffeine, because you can buy like caffeine pills on Amazon, um, I don't really recommend they last for like four hours, and then like you crash really hard. Um, also, the caffeine tastes awful because it's super, super bitter. Um, that's why we usually have it in drinks and stuff. They also feel slippery, so soaps uh, are often at least partially basic. And if you do end up spilling some base on your hand, it will feel slippery as it's reacting with the oils on your hand, which protect you from that base. And that's why you need to wash it off as soon as possible, because as soon as it gets through the oils, then it'll start to react with your skin. But again, we'll come back to acids and bases more specifically later. Um, things to look for in these acid-base neutralization reactions is whether or not you have an acid. Again, right? These all start with hydrogen. Sometimes they have more than one hydrogen. Um, and then these bases are all metals with hydroxide, so that OH. So uh, acid-base reactions are, I think I've mentioned combustion reactions. So combustion reactions always have the same two products, carbon dioxide and water. In an acid-base reaction, you're always going to have one product that's the same, and that's water. And then the other product is going to be the anion from the acid and the cation from the base to make what's called a salt. So anytime you have an ionic compound, uh, see any ionic compound? Yeah, I think any ionic compound is considered a salt. Um, so more general term uh, than like table salt. Although in this case it is table salt. Um, yeah, so this is a salt rifle. <laughs> I 
sorry, it's terrible. Um, yes. Yeah. <laughs> it's very bad for your blood pressure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, okay, so the pattern for acid-base reactions is you have your acid, and you have your base, and they react together to form water and a salt. A salt. Um, and when you write out a net ionic equation for an acid-base reaction, it's always going to be H plus plus OH minus makes H2O. Because if you were to write out something like, uh, let's see, hydrochloric acid plus sodium hydroxide, and then we'd get H2O plus NaCl. So sodium chloride is soluble in water. And so we could write out a complete ionic equation. So that's all of the ions in solution. Cl minus, Na plus, plus OH minus, and then we'll get H2O, because the H2O is a molecule. It's a molecular compound, so it's not going to dissociate in water. Also, it is the water. It's a liquid plus Na plus plus Cl minus. So when we look at either side of the reaction, the reactants, the products, the reactants, or the, we have some that are the same. So it'll be chloride still chloride, and sodium is still sodium. And so we'll exclude those. You can write this. This is the complete ionic equation. This would be the molecular equation. And then our net ionic equation will just be H plus plus OH minus H2O. And this would be the net ionic equation. Sort of recap and use some of the stuff that we got from last time. They have to have hydroxide. So it's the, it's the OH minus hydroxide group to be a base. Yeah, so not just oxygen, but yeah, hydrogen also. Acid is that an E or an L? It's an L. Can write it. Okay. So acid-base reactions always going to end up the same. And in a way, we're kind of doing what we did with the um, uh, precipitation reactions when we're predicting, if you're predicting products here. Because you write the H plus, you can think of the H plus as being there. It's part of the water. Or the, and then the Na plus moves over, and it's in the same, same order there. And then we're swapping the anions. And when you do that, and combine H plus with OH minus, it just becomes water. And then you get NaCl as the other product. Right, so you're going to write a molecular net ionic equation for the reaction that occurs between aqueous uh, H2SO4 and aqueous KOH. What is H2SO4? What's the name of that compound? Sulfuric acid, yeah, and then potassium hydroxide. So the molecular equation will be H2SO4 plus potassium hydroxide. And what are our products going to be? It's an acid-base neutralization reaction. Water 
Water and a salt, yeah. So H2O will be one of them. And then what would the salt be? This, may, this one's a little bit harder. Potassium sulfate, yeah. And it'll be K2SO4 because the potassium has a one plus charge, sulfate has a two minus charge. So that's our, well actually, <clears throat> that's the molecular not balanced yet. So how can I balance this equation? Mm -hmm. Two in front of the potassium hydroxide, so we got one potassium here, and then there's two potassiums and sulfate, so two potassium hydroxide. Does that balance it? Not yet. These can be a little bit trickier to balance because we're forming water here which is sort of doing a different thing than anything than any of the reactions that we've really looked at before. Um, it's kind of similar to an oxidation or a um, combustion reaction. But where, where's, the, where's the oxygen in this water coming from? Yeah, it's coming from this one from our potassium hydroxide, because we know it's not coming from the sulfate, one, because sulfate's a polyatomic ion, um, and we haven't talked about any reactions where that changes, but also we have sulfate complete over here. Yeah. So this is coming from here, so how many oxygen atoms do we have here in potassium hydroxide, and how many do we have in water? Yeah. In water, there's just one. So how many do we need to add? Or well, you just need a a two, yeah, yeah. So we'll need two total waters there. So now the water, which we know is coming from the hydroxide, is balanced, and then one of those hydrogens is coming from here. And then this is something that we haven't looked at yet, but. Sulfuric acid is a diprotic acid, so it has two protons that it can donate, right? Because if it gets rid of those two protons, then it becomes sulfate, and sulfate is what we have on the right side of the reaction. This will probably be a little more clear when we write out the net ionic equation, or the complete ionic equation. So for that complete ionic equation, this will be 2H+, plus because we get two, sulf or two protons, two hydrogens from uh, sulfuric acid plus SO4 two minus plus 2K plus plus two OH minus. And I'm just keeping all of the coefficients or I'm using the coefficients to write out how many of each ion that we're getting. Then water this in, water's a liquid, so that's gonna stay as 2H2O. And then this will be 2K plus plus SO4 two minus. So we can get yeah, two hydrogens from sulfuric acid. Now, which, which ions or which species in the solution, remember species is just one of the ions, which species can we cancel out? Mm -hmm. So we're looking for species that are the same on both sides of the chemical equation. Yep, and the two potassiums. Because right, we don't have any 
H plus by itself in the products, and we don't have any OH minus by itself in the products. They became water, uh, which does not dissociate. So then we have two H plus plus two OH minus is oops, two H two O. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And then anti-ionic equation right out the charges. Um, partially because then when you, well, if you do it as part of a precipitation reaction, then when you're trying to recombine those products, you know, you have the charges written out already. It's very easier to combine correctly. And then we could simplify this because, right, we have two of everything. So H plus plus OH minus is H2O. So even though we have two protons, two hydrogens from the sulfate, the sulfuric acid, I mean, um, it all boils down to the same net ionic equation for every uh, acid-base neutralization reaction. All right. So that's it for acid-base reactions. Uh, now we're going to talk about gas evolution reactions. So there are, um, there are really just a few gas evolution reactions uh, that we talked about in this class. So the gas evolution reactions produce a gas, uh, as their name would suggest. So one of those is if you have an acid like H2SO4 reacting with um, something with sulfur in it. So this is lithium sulfide. One of the products that you get is H2S gas. Dihydrogen sulfide. And then you'll get a salt also. So the one that you need to remember is if you ever get a product that's H2S, that's a gas. A really, really smelly gas. Sulfur always smells bad. <clears throat> um, the other ones that we cover uh, all involve an intermediate product that decomposes to produce a gas. So here we've got hydrochloric acid reacting with sodium bicarbonate. That's the white powder that you have on the uh, desks or the lab benches. It neutralizes acids. And actually when it neutralizes those acids, it is the carbonate that picks up the hydrogens. And then this <clears throat> H2CO3, carbonic acid, is not particularly stable. And so it falls apart. And when it falls apart, it becomes water and CO2 gas. So I think this is uh, sodium bicarbonate, I think is baking soda. I never remember if it's baking soda or baking powder. It's one of those two. But if you mix those with vinegar, they generate a bunch of bubbles and gas. Uh, so that's what's happening here. So it's mm -hmm. because you're getting acid from the lemon. Yeah, it fizzes or it effervesces, if you want the SAT word. <clears throat> so yeah, here the gas that we're forming is because we formed H2CO3 and then that will give you H2O and CO2 gas. So things to look out for when, if I give you a question that says, like predict the products of this reaction. So if I gave you something like this and you do your, you know, draw the ions, then you switch the anions. If you get H2CO3 is one of the products, that should be sort of a flag for you that, oh, that's going to further decompose into um, water and CO2 gas, which would make it a gas evolution reaction. Water? Carbonated water is different. So carbonated water is actually, um, when you add pressurized CO2, you can dissolve the CO2 directly into water. And then when you release the pressure, the CO2 comes back out. So a couple other ones. 
Um, the one that is most, so there's two here that are very, very similar. That's the H2CO3, carbonic acid, but also sulfurous acid. Um, either time you, or whenever you get one of those, H2CO3, H2SO3, those will decompose and their products are similar. Whoa, okay. Uh, so water and CO2 for, um, well, what would come from H2CO3, and then water and SO2 if it's sulfurous acid that you form. The last one that does also form uh, some gas is ammonia, well, ammonium. So this is ammonium chloride. That ammonium chloride can react with a base. This is another potassium hydroxide is a base. And it forms water and ammonia gas. So really, you just kind of have to memorize those. And what I would memorize are these, well not the, the H2S has no intermediate product, but these intermediate products, H2CO3, H2SO3, and H4OH. If you get any of those three, I know it's three more things on the mountain of things that you have to memorize, but three more things, um, then you know that's a gas evolution reaction. Uh, so when you're writing an equation for a gas evolution reaction, you'll write a skeletal equation that includes the reactants and then the products that form when the cation, uh, cation of each reactant combines with the anion of the other. So that's exactly what we did with the precipitation reactions, swapping anions. And then you're looking for, again, H2CO3, H2SO3, or ammonium hydroxide. Um, and then they'll decompose into those gases, you know, H2O and CO2 for water, H2O and SO2 for H2CO3. Um, I think I said that wrong. Ammonia for ammonium hydroxide. And then after you've written out that, then you balance it. So you get this sort of long equation to balance. So we'll do an example of that. So you'll have two reaction arrows as a part of this. So if we have um, hydrobromic acid, what's the formula for hydrobromic acid? What kind of compounds start with hydro? acids, and so bromic would be which element? Bromine. So hydrobromic acid, now hydro is only for binary acids, so this is going to be HBr. And then potassium sulfite, I don't know what potassium is, right, K plus, and sulfite is SO3, and what's the charge? Yeah, two minus. So this will be K2SO3. Just trying to help you out for that nomenclature quiz next week. Um, all right, so we've got a reaction between HBr plus uh, K2SO3. That's gonna form something. So we're gonna have, so I'm gonna, you don't have to write out like the ions, but I think it's helpful, especially when you're starting out with predicting products. So we're gonna have H plus, plus Br minus, plus, uh, I'm gonna say 2K plus, plus SO3, two minus. And then we'll take our cations 
write them in the same order. Actually, no, let's not, sorry, don't take the two. And then we'll swap the anions. So this will be SO3, two minus, and Br minus. I wanna say this is different from writing out a complete ionic equation because the complete ionic equation you usually do from the molecular equation because you'll already have written everything out and then balanced it. And that's when you wanna carry down those coefficients. And the reason I'm not doing that here is because when we, if I carried out that two here and the two here, we don't get two potassiums for one bromide. They wouldn't balance the charges. Because um, the next step that we want to do is balance those charges. So we'll get H2SO3. So I added another hydrogen because of the two minus charge on the sulfite. And then this will be KBr. And then before we balance this one, we need to recognize that sulfurous acid decomposes. And what does it decompose into? Water. Water. And SO2, gas. So now when you're balancing this, we're gonna have to balance both equations. Now, um, I think it's gonna be easier to balance one of them first and then balance the other. So if we balance uh, this first portion, oops, didn't mean to get that. All right, so if we're balancing just this, what should my first move be, or should we put a coefficient? You guys started off so talkative today. <laughs> uh, yeah, we could put a two in front of the HBR, because we have one hydrogen here, but we have two hydrogens here. So we put a two here, yeah. And then that'll change our number of bromines. So we'll have to go over here and balance that. So add a two there. And now that balance changes potassium, so there's two potassiums, and that'll balance with the K2 on the SO3. Now we can look over here and say, how do we balance this with this? Mm -hmm. So this is one of those places where we're taking that sulfite and it does break up. So one of the rare cases where we have that happen. But there's already one oxygen here, there's two oxygens there, so that's three. One sulfur here, one sulfur there. So it's already balanced. The only thing we might wanna do is add that in addition to these things, because that's the sulfite breaking down, we'll still have that two KBr in the solution. So as a final overall reaction, you could say maybe that you don't need this middle part, because that's just an intermediate No, no, no. I would want to see the middle part, actually. Yeah. I would kind of expect to see that for a question like this. Um, yeah. Cool. Other questions? Now we're going to talk about oxidation reduction reactions. <clears throat> so 
Reactions involving the transfer of electrons are called oxidation reduction reactions. Sometimes you don't see anything really happen aside from the transfer of electrons. Kind of makes them sneaky, because we're not just transferring atoms, we're transferring also electrons between things. Um, these are very, very common reactions. Things like um, uh, rusting iron, or if you've bleached your hair before, um, or the production of electricity and batteries even is an oxidation reduction reaction where we're pushing electrons around. And actually in today's lab, you'll get to do that. So you'll do a chemical, I guess we'll call it a chemical redox reaction first. You'll take zinc and you'll take iodide, you'll mix them together, and they'll exchange electrons to become zinc iodide. And then at the end of the lab, you're gonna take it and you'll have it in a dish You'll attach two electrodes, two copper wires, that'll go into the solution and then hook it up to a battery. And then that battery will force the electrons to go back to where they were when you started the reaction. So getting back zinc and iodine again. It's a cool lab. It's a very quick lab too. Um, so many but not all redox reactions will involve the reaction of a substance with oxygen. So the one we'll do today won't involve oxygen, but the magnesium oxide, determining the empirical formula of magnesium oxide, that was a redox reaction. And we reacted zinc, or sorry, not zinc, magnesium with oxygen. So we oxidized uh, the magnesium. So some redox reactions involving oxygen. Uh, if you have hydrogen reacting with oxygen, um, it's a redox reaction, oxidizing the hydrogen. Uh, this is actually the reaction that powers, or powered, I should say, the space shuttle, the original space shuttles. Um, hydrogen's a very, very hard thing to uh, contain because it's so small. And actually, the recent, um, if you've been following any of the space shuttle stuff, the recent Artemis rocket got shut down multiple times. They scrubbed the launch because of hydrogen problems trying to get hydrogen into the boosters um, was freezing things and leaking out, and so they had to scrub the launch. Uh, rusting of iron is another redox reaction. So a lot of metals, any metal that corrodes in air, so like even silver, right, gets a, let's, if you're fancy, it's called a patina. <laughs> you wanna say, ooh, this is rusty, but it's fancy rust. Um, that's oxygen reacting with silver. So a lot of these, um, a lot of metals will do this. And similarly, the magnesium reacted with oxygen, that was an oxidation reaction. Or even the combustion of natural gas or gasoline, all oxidation redox reactions. <clears throat> so redox reactions don't have to involve oxygen. Like I already mentioned, the one we're doing today is not going to involve oxygen. Um, also, the reaction between, if you remember, sodium metal is like super dangerous, highly reactive, catches on fire in air. Um, but if you react that with chlorine gas, which is also super dangerous, uh, you get table salt, and that's a redox reaction. So the definition of oxidation is loss of electrons, and the definition of reduction is gain of electrons. And so the mnemonic that I use for those is oil rig. So oxidation is loss, that's the oil, and reduction is gain. So it's being reduced, it's gaining electrons. If it's being oxidized, it's losing electrons. So if you have um, just a go over this real quick because I think this is a little bit confusing because gaining electrons makes it more negative and I think it's not intuitive. Um, so if we have something like our magnesium, if that has a zero charge and it goes from a zero charge to Mg2+, plus, did it gain or lose electrons? It lost electrons. Because magnesium metal, magnesium metal will have, so it has 12 protons, right? Remember, uh, neutral atoms have the same number of 
protons as they do electrons. So if magnesium here has 12 protons, if it's neutral, that means it has 12 electrons. And then if it, it can't gain or lose protons, because that would change the element. But over here, if it loses two electrons, so it still has 12 protons, but now only has 10 electrons. And then we do, right, so 12, maybe I could write protons as P plus. So it's the, uh, oh, sorry, it's the number of electrons minus the number of protons. No, protons minus electrons, I was right. 12 protons minus 12 electrons would be zero. 12 protons minus 10 electrons would be positive two. So if a number gets more positive, or if a charge, the charge of an element gets more positive, that means it's losing electrons. Because every electron has a negative charge. So if it gains electrons, then it's going to get more negative. So magnesium here would be oxidized. Oxidation is loss. All right, so oxidation and reduction have to occur together though. Those electrons can't go just to nowhere. It won't ever just like shed electrons and then you got free electrons. That's called actually alpha radiation. <laughs> Uh, I think it's alpha radiation. Uh, if one substance loses electrons, then those electrons have to be gained by something else. Um, it says for now you simply need to be able to identify them, but we are gonna go into chapter 16. Need to modify these slides. Um, <clears throat> so redox reactions are those in which a substance reacts with elemental oxygen, metal reacts with non-metal, or one substance transfers electrons to another substance. And we will talk about that more um, when we hop over to chapter 16. Which we might actually get to. Okay. So which of these are redox reactions? And actually, I'm gonna get more than one of these, yeah. So if anything exists by itself as an element, it has a zero charge. So lithium here, zero charge. Chlorine, zero charge. But what kind of compound is lithium chloride? Ionic, molecular, or I guess ionic or molecular? What is an ionic compound? Metal and a non-metal. So lithium chloride is a metal and a non-metal. So it's ionic. And remember, ions have charges. So ionic compounds are made up of a positive and a negative charge. So here in lithium chloride now, we've gone from having zero charge to lithium's gonna have a charge. And it will be the charge that you would predict from the periodic table, the one that you learned. So it's going to Li plus and chlorine is going to be Cl minus. So is this a redox reaction? Yeah, because we went from zero to a positive and from zero for chlorine to a negative. So was lithium oxidized or reduced? Remember oil rig. Yeah. Lithium was oxidized, so it loses one electron because its charge got more positive. Chlorine then had to be reduced because they'll always occur together. So in this reaction, lithium, and this is why we have two lithiums because there are two chlorine atoms, each of those lithium atoms is giving up one electron to a chlorine. And so then chlorine is reduced because it gained an electron. What about for 
oh, I should say this is redox, and I'll write lithium oxidized chlorine produced. So for B, is this a redox reaction? Mm -hmm. So remember, aluminum here is an element by itself. And if no charge, I guess specifically if no charge, because aluminum here is by itself, but it does have a charge written in. If there's no charge written in, then it's no charge when it's an element by itself. So we have aluminum here with, a, again, zero charge. Tin has a two plus, but then in the reactants, tin is zero. So yeah, this is a redox. Now, which of those was oxidized? And this is gonna be starting with one of these. So it's the process. Oxidation is a process from going from here to here or from here to there. So is aluminum or tin oxidized? Why? Yeah, yeah. So aluminum became more positive, went from zero to plus three. So aluminum is oxidized. And then what about tin? It's reduced. Um, so in a problem like this, or in an equation like this, where you only have two things, if you can identify one of them as being oxidized or reduced, then the other one has to be the opposite. Right, so because aluminum here was being oxidized, oxidation and reduction have to occur together. And so tin then had to be reduced because those electrons had to go somewhere and they go to the tin. What about this next one? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh huh. Ah, good question. So this is why there are three tin atoms. And there's only two aluminum atoms. Yeah. So the two aluminums together will lose six total electrons, and then there's three tin atoms that each gain two. Yeah. So when we get to like balancing redox reactions, that's exactly what we're doing, right? Because it looks like if you just look at the charges. It's like, wait, yeah, there's one electron that's not accounted for. And so these are harder to balance because when you get all of a sudden, um, there'll be more complicated redox reactions. Um, but there are steps. It's a whole procedure. It's its whole, own whole thing. Um, yeah, so yeah, for C, is this a redox reaction? How do we know that it's a redox reaction? We'll know it's a redox reaction if the charges change, right? So if we can write out here, a, net, a complete ionic equation would help a lot. Maybe not even, we don't even really have to write a complete ionic equation, but just identifying what the charges are. So the charge on lead is gonna be based on, so lead is one of those elements can have multiple different types of charges. So we'll use nitrate, which is always a one minus charge to figure out what it is. So this is gonna be PB2 plus. Nitrate's gonna be NO3 minus. Uh, lithium always has the same charge, La plus, Cl minus. And then in our products, we'll say, okay, lead again, we have to determine what its charge is based on what it's bound to. So it's bound to chlorine, again, one minus, and there's two of those. So this is Pb2 plus, we'll have Cl minus. 
Li plus and NO3 minus. So do any of our charges change? Nope, they all stay the same. So this is, well, what type of reaction is this then? It's a precipitation reaction because we're forming a solid, lead chloride solid. Neat. So what about D? This is a little trickier because we don't have ionic compounds. So how do we know what the charge is for carbon or oxygen? Well, for oxygen, you can figure out what the charge for oxygen. But for this kind of reaction, at least for now, the next thing we're going to do, of course, is chapter 16. So we're going to talk about this. Um, when you have molecular compounds, we don't use charges. Uh, we use something called an oxidation state, which is usually, in this class, the same as the charge, but it's representing something different. Um, the other way you can identify a redox reaction is if something is reacting with elemental oxygen. So we have carbon reacting with oxygen to form carbon dioxide. So this would be a redox reaction. It's a redox. Um, yeah, we'll get to um, oxidation states. Probably not today. Any other questions on these? This is a good, good lead into remember this stuff for chapter 16. So combustion reactions are a subcategory of oxidation reduction reactions because, again, we have in combustion reactions, something is reacting with oxygen. So if something reacts with oxygen, that's an oxidation reaction. Um, but in particular, they form specific compounds. They're going to form carbon dioxide, CO2, and water uh, as the products. So when you have compounds containing carbon and hydrogen, or carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, reacting with O2, um, then you'll emit heat, and then you'll get these CO2 and water as the products. So, so far we've got like the reactions that you need to like specifically remember. Precipitation reactions always form a solid. That solid could be a lot of different things. It'll depend on solubility table. There's the gas evolution reactions, and those have like H2CO3, H2SO3, remember those two, and ammonium hydroxide and H4OH. Those are specific ones that you should memorize. Um, there's also the acid-base neutralization reactions, which will always produce water as one of their products and a salt, not a salt rifle. And now combustion reactions always form CO2 and H2O. So ethanol and alcoholic beverages combust to form carbon dioxide and water. Um, yeah. Oh yeah, this is where you get to tell this story. In high school, don't do this at home, because this was in high school. I knew far, far less then than I do now. Uh, I learned at some point that you could take isopropyl alcohol and it's less dense than water, so it'll float on the surface of water. So you can pour isopropyl alcohol into water and then light it on fire. And so while I was on lunch, went back to my parents' house, nobody else was home, took a little glass measuring cup, filled it like halfway with water, poured some isopropyl alcohol in there, lit it on fire, and it burnt. I was like, ha, ah, that's cool. And then I realized I had to put it out. And so how do you put out a fire? You pour water on it. <laughs> and so I took water, cold water, and this had been burning long enough to get the glass hot, and I just I was like, well, I think I knew something about like, oh, it needs to smother the thing. So I like dumped it in, and the heat shock, the temperature change shock was enough to shatter the glass measuring cup all over the kitchen. And fortunately, there was enough, I don't know, turbulence there, dispersion that it put out the fire. <laughs> 
but don't do that at home. <laughs> it was my terrible mistake to make. Hopefully you don't do that. If you do end up in a situation like that, the, the trick is you smother it. So you can do something, I'd recommend take like a, in that case where the like surface is uneven on the top, take like a dish rag or a dish towel, get it wet, and then just cover it. And that will suffocate the fire without exploding everything. <laughs> uh, so combustion reactions. Uh, ethanol will burn. So that's why you can get like the, um, you've probably seen like, the, like they'll have like flaming shots in some places and they like drop that into something else to put the fire out before you drink it. But um, ethanol will burn. So this is a compound with carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen in it. But when it reacts with, again, elemental oxygen here, making it a redox reaction, you'll form CO2 and H2O. Huh? <laughs> yeah. Drink the vapors. Uh, uh, octane and gasoline reacts also with oxygen. So that's C8H18 uh, octane. The Oct, like an octagon, has eight carbons in it. Um, forms a whole bunch of CO2 and water. All right, so if we wanted to write a balanced equation for the combustion of liquid pentane, which is a component of gasoline, um, we'd start by just writing C5H12. And what is this going to react with? oxygen. So that's O2. So in this case, if you have elemental oxygen, it's going to be O2. That's, again, Brinkelhoff. All of these, when they are in their elemental form, are diatomic. And what are the products for a combustion reaction? CO2 H2O. and H2O. Same thing every time for combustion reactions. CO2, H2O. Uh, okay, now we have to balance this. We have actually balanced a uh, oxy or combustion reaction before. Um, so the only thing that we don't want to start with is oxygen. Because oxygen is by itself for one, and it's also part of CO2 and water. So carbon or hydrogen first, and we'll just look over here and say, oh, five carbons, that's one carbon, so we need five of those. And then 12 hydrogens in pentane, so we need to come over here and say H2, let's make that a six. This one's gonna be easier to balance. So uh, that means that we will have a total of 10 oxygens and six oxygens. So 16 total oxygens. So now we, how do we get 16 oxygens in the reactants? Eight. And that's balanced. So again, the key for these is remember that it's, because I could give you a reaction, I could give you this problem. This would be fair game. I could say, here's pentane. Write a chemical, balance chemical equation for the reaction, or the combustion of pentane. And expect you to know that it has to react with oxygen, and then it's gonna form CO2 and water, and then you balance it like, really like any other uh, chemical equation. Uh-huh. Oh, I'll always give you for pentane and octane, that kind of thing, I'll give you, um, I'll give you the formula. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You don't need to know, that's organic chemistry nomenclature. So don't expect you to know that. Okay. <clears throat> so we talked now about um, a couple ways of classifying chemical reactions. One of them is by uh, what happens. So. These are all what is happening in the reaction, right? In a precipitation reaction, you form a precipitate. 
in a, an acid-base reaction, or acid-base neutralization reaction, you're neutralizing an acid with a base or a base with an acid. In a gas evolution reactions, or reaction, you're producing a gas. Um, a lot of those are going to be acid-base reactions also. These aren't exclusive categories. Uh, and then for oxidation reduction reactions, we talked about how is that transfer of electrons. So if you get charges that change for certain elements, um, that's an oxidation reduction. And then a subcategory of that is combustion. I know that those, the red is not great. Let's write that next to it. So those are combustion reactions, which are oxidation reduction reactions, but a special type of uh, oxidation reduction. <clears throat> the other way that we can classify things, and this is the part that you needed for um, a lot of that last lab, um, which was also on, to be fair, in the introduction. It does explain some of this. But we can also classify by how the atoms are rearranged inside of a reaction. So in a synthesis or a combination reaction, you take two separate things and you stick them together. In a decomposition reaction, you take two things that are stuck together, and you separate them. So like the gas evolution reactions, um, for the H2, CO3, H2, SO3, and ammonium hydroxide, those are decomposition, breaking apart into two other things. Then a single, so displacement or also called single displacement reaction, you're taking two things that are bound together and you're swapping it out with a new thing. <clears throat> uh, so the C here, right, changes places, trades partners. And then in the double displacement, <coughs> oh, don't know what that was. A double displacement reaction, we've got the cations trading anions. Uh, at least that's what, yeah, I'm pretty sure all the double, double displacement reactions that we have are cations, they're just swapping those anions. So all of the precipitation reactions that we did, those are double displacement. So it's very quickly, synthesis or combination reactions, we're, we're taking this is the sodium chloride. So there's some sodium metal. Let's zoom in on that. Sodium metal in here, and then chlorine gas around it. Those are combining to form really disgusting looking table salt, <laughs> uh, but forming table salt. All right, so you're getting a single product. Decomposition. Reactions, you have one reactant and you get two or more products, separate chemicals. This is one that you can safely do at home. Take a nine volt, volt battery, put it in some salty water because you need an electrolyte in the water to be able to conduct electricity. Um, and you can separate oxygen and hydrogen from the water. So you're taking the H2O and breaking it apart. And if you do this with test tubes like this, you can actually see the ratio, I'll draw this line here, see the ratio of hydrogen to oxygen because gases take up the same amount of space. Um, we'll talk more about that when we get to gases. You see there's about twice as much hydrogen as there is oxygen. That's because you get twice as many hydrogen atoms out of water than you do oxygen atoms. So you can make pure oxygen at home. Um, but that's a decomposition, so you're taking one thing, making two products. Uh, single displacement reactions are where you're taking, um, well, one element is displacing another in a compound. So this is a redox reaction here, and this is actually um, copper plating. So this is a bar of zinc, and then you place it into the water and the outer layer of zinc atoms gets replaced by copper atoms. And then the zinc ends up in the solution. So single displacement reaction. Don't have very many of those. 
Double displacements are probably going to be the most common. Uh, we have two elements or groups of elements and two different compounds, and they trade anions. Um, so yeah, precipitation reactions, acid-base reactions, and gas, gas evolution reactions, all going to be double displacement. So then, again, these are classifying based on how the atoms are trading places. Um, we have synthesis, decomposition, single displacement, and double displacement. So classify each reaction as a synthesis, decomposition, single displacement, double displacement. So first reaction here, which one is that? Single displacement, double displacement, synthesis, decomposition. Let's get votes for synthesis, decomposition, single displacement. Yeah, single displacement reaction. So the aluminum here is replacing the hydrogens in that phosphate to form aluminum phosphate. And for B, synthesis, decomposition, single displacement, double displacement. Yeah, it's a double displacement. And then for this last one, synthesis. And then one more, so yeah, the last one that we have in the list of four, decomposition. So single reactant, multiple products, it's decomposition. Hooray. All right, so that's chapter seven.